I'm very pleased to welcome this afternoon on Power Lunch, Dr. Rajiv Lal, Managing Director and CEO at IDFC Bank. Dr. Lal, many thanks for joining us. Um, you know what my first question is, demonetization and its impact on the Indian banking system. When we look back at this period, what do you think the analysis will be? Well, this is a, uh, you know, it's very difficult to uh, make an assessment at this point because we are in completely uncharted waters. Um, but given how uh, important and fundamental this uh, event is, um, I expect that in a couple of years from now, um, we will look back at this as a watershed moment um, which will um, signal the definitive shift uh, to more formal economic activity and greater formalization of the financial system in the country. Um, so I'm expecting that uh, this will induce behavioral change, that this behavioral change will be encouraged and nurtured aggressively uh, by government um, and players in the financial system um, to uh, through very rapid and extensive investment in last mile um, what is called the acceptance infrastructure uh, to facilitate um, a continued uh, uh, use um, of the banking system as uh, the intermediary of choice um, uh, as opposed to cash. So if you wanted to, if you want to measure it, um, uh, we, uh, this will be the watershed moment uh, after which the cash to GDP ratio in this country um, will begin to fall. Okay, cash to GDP ratio will begin to fall. But what has uh, the IDFC Bank experience been since the 9th of November, which is indicative of the larger point you made? So uh, we have seen um, uh, two, two, three things. I mean, uh, one is that uh, uh, as if every other bank, there is a huge and heightened degree of interest um, in electronic payment solutions of all kinds um, at uh, the level of government, obviously, but also at the level of merchants and at the level of uh, uh, the broader customer base. And this uh, uh, openness of mind um, uh, to move to uh, uh, cashless forms of payments is not just restricted uh, to more sophisticated players and merchants. Um, it is also uh, at the deep rural level. Uh, but at that level, it, it, uh, the interest from the customer base uh, really is triggered by government initiative. So, you know, the government of Andhra Pradesh is a particularly good example. Um, uh, that administration has really seized this opportunity um, to press the accelerator now uh, in expanding the infrastructure for um, um, cash benefit transfers, um, EPDS, um, the, the whole uh, transfer mechanism of subsidies and other support that government provides uh, through electronic means account to account um, and uh, we are seeing you know very very rapid take up of that um, in pilots that we've been conducting there can you elaborate specifically on the role you're playing in partnership with the government of andhra pradesh specific examples that make the idea the concept of a digital payments infrastructure more real well, see, the, the, the key to making uh, payments um, digital um, is that um, uh, the movement of um, funds uh, should happen from account to account, meaning from, in this case, government uh, to a designated bank account of, of, of an individual. Um, um, of a targeted individual, an eligible individual. Um, and that problem can now be solved using um, the Aadhaar identification, authentication, and its seeding uh, with bank accounts. So Andhra Pradesh is very advanced 
in matching individual bank accounts to people's Aadhaar numbers. And they are also very advanced in then identifying from this population of Aadhaar seeded accounts which accounts are eligible for what kind of subsidies. So that's uh, uh, important groundwork um, that government has to do. Then on the technology side, what it requires uh, is, a, is a system, a point of access uh, that is, and this is fundamentally important, that is interoperable, which means that anybody using this infrastructure, uh, 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 the system has to be agnostic of which bank um, the customer might be using. So. Um, uh, uh, the technology is available to design such a system um, and NPCI have actually made a huge contribution by making what is called the AEPS uh, which is the Aadhaar enabled payment system in a, uh, interoperable. So now today if you come to an IDFC um, uh, micro ATM, IDFC bank micro ATM in Andhra Pradesh or for that matter anywhere else that it is being deployed, it doesn't matter that you don't have an account with IDFC bank, but at that point, uh, at that micro ATM, um, you, can, you can conduct any basic transaction. You can receive money into your account, you can transfer money from your account to somebody else. Um, you can uh, deposit money into your account. Um, you can get a bank account statement. Uh, and most importantly, you can also withdraw cash um, at that point. So uh, two, two features. One is the uh, two important characteristics are required to make this successful. Government has to do its own groundwork in terms of seeding, seeding um, Aadhaar bank accounts um, and um, the provider of the service um, has to be able to deploy an interoperable infrastructure at the last mile. Would you agree, uh, Dr. Lal, if I said that the government, both at the center and at the state level, is playing an uneven role, so the path forward isn't an optimal one? Um, yes, it's a mixed picture. You are absolutely right. Um, but um, you know this is the um, this is the nice feature um, um, uh, of uh, competitive federalism when people see other states see what um, Andhra Pradesh is doing um, uh, they will follow very quickly so already Madhya Pradesh Rajasthan amongst other states Jharkhand all these states are uh, trying to replicate the the learnings from Andhra Pradesh quite quickly. Um, but speed is of the essence, and I think this is a, a, a moment in time, an opportunity that we really must grasp collectively um, and work very hard to make the acceptance infrastructure deep and ubiquitous across the country. Speed is certainly of the essence, uh, given the negative shock of demonetization, which allows me to move forward in our conversation. Your recent comments suggest that you think uh, you know, estimates that suggest a 2% hit to GDP due to demonetization are overblown. We're at a complex juncture. What's your assessment of the hit to GDP? So, no, I've taken the view that it's impossible to know what the exact implications of for short-term GDP growth are going to be. Undoubtedly, it's a shock. It's a negative shock for the economy. So, uh, it, will, it will slow down growth. There is no doubt about it. How deep a slowdown, it is really impossible to tell. And it has to do really with the speed with which uh, 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 the RBI and the banks together are able to reintroduce uh, the new legal tender um, uh, to all points uh, where it is required. In economic terms, the problem is, uh, is, quite, is, quite, is quite simple. Um, you know, there is, there is a certain demand for cash, which is 12-14% of GDP, which is the 14 lakh crore um, of cash that was in the system. Now there has been a supply shock. It doesn't mean that demand behavior has changed. Um, and so unless supply meets at least a bulk of that demand fairly quickly, um, that de uh, supply demand mismatch of cash will result in a real economic shock which will be mitigated over time 
as the supply constraint of cash um, itself is um, becomes uh, more loosened and more cash is made available. And we'll probably hear from the RBI governor at the policy meet an announcement. What are your own expectations and actually prescriptions, if you'll offer some, ahead of the RBI meet this week? So, I mean, it's not a, it's not that, I mean, these decisions are very complex, very difficult to make. I think the simplistic expectation of market participants is that rates must be cut. Um, uh, but there are, uh, uh, you know, other nuances that uh, the RBI will have to surely take into account. Um, there is the interest rate decision in the United States. Um, there is the political uncertainty and its knock-on impact on financial um, uh, activity uh, emanating from the European elections um, and the impact of all of this um, on the rupee. These are all things that the RBI will have to weigh as they uh, make a decision on the interest rate. But whatever decision the RBI make, the reality today in, in the Indian banking system is that the uh, cash, uh, the, uh, the credit to deposit ratio um, has, uh, has come down. So there is more liquidity in the banking system um, than there is credit demand. Um, and as a result of that, um, even if the RBI does not cut rates or cuts them only modestly, notwithstanding that, I expect banks to lower their interest rates, their lending rates, and possibly also the deposit rates in the coming months. Here's something simplistic, but I'm going to ask it anyway. There's demonetization, there's the 100% incremental CRR for a limited window. I mean, the list of events is a long one. What are the navigational challenges for banks in general, and IDFC Bank in particular here on? Yeah, so this... <laughs> You're right, it makes for a very interesting um, short-term challenge um, because, uh, I mean, there is the, there are at least three dimensions to the immediate management challenge. One is the logistics of it. Um, you know, you have, to, you have to provide a certain degree of customer service um, and demand for cash at uh, access points for, um, uh, for customers in the branches and such like. Um, that's quite a logistical challenge, and I, it's, I mean, it's fair to uh, to note, only fair to note that the banks have been working very, very hard um, to alleviate the immediate inconvenience to customers as best as we possibly can. Second challenge um, outside of day-to-day -day operations um, is uh, taking stock and uh, trying to understand uh, what might turn out to be um, implications for asset quality. Um, so, uh, you know, for instance, um, in rural lending um, and micro SME lending, uh, collections have come down. Does this mean a longer term damage to asset quality? We don't really know, but we have to uh, keep assessing that real time. Um, and figure out uh, how to prepare ourselves and to absorb that shock. I don't think that shock is going to be very meaningful, but nevertheless, uh, it requires a adroit, adroit um, uh, management uh, reaction to that. And then the third thing is really um, um, assessing and processing um, what is happening and figuring out what is the real opportunity um, that uh, that lies ahead of us, and so for a new bank like IDFC Bank, uh, I I believe that actually it's an enormous opportunity for us now um, to accelerate the rollout of our uh, uh, our model uh, that relies on technology assisted distribution, um, um, and it goes in the direction of uh, um, investing very quickly. Um, and at scale in building um, an acceptance infrastructure around the country. So uh, players that are able to do that very quickly um, in a commercial sense, in a market share sense, in a business opportunity sense will surely benefit um, over the next couple of years and we are very excited about that. 
Um, what markers will you be looking for to suggest that things are back uh, on track? Um, so, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, for for, for us, uh, things are not really majorly out of track, uh, off track uh, at all at this point. Um, uh, you know, we are uh, ironically um, uh, fortunate that we don't have a very large uh, branch footprint, and therefore we don't have to cope with um, you know the logistical challenges that a lot of my colleagues are faced with in the rest of the banking system. Nor do we have a very large exposure um, to uh, 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 rural India um, and to the micro SME or the MFI uh, microfinance seg um, uh, customer segments of the market at this point. And therefore, the asset quality issues, if they were to materialize, will also be not be particularly material for us. Uh, so for us, this is really a time of uh, uh, really getting our act together um, to execute at scale. And so galvanizing um, our organization to do that and really bring forward uh, plans that we had to roll out over the next three, four years. We want, now want to do them in 12 to 24 months. It's a huge execution challenge, but it is very exciting. And, you know, finally, uh, GST, the goods and services tax, do you think that the April deadline is endangered due to the political upheaval around demonetization? That's very difficult for me to assess. Um, I mean, I know as much about it as you do, or through you, through the media, really. Um, uh, I, I, I mean, as a citizen of the, of the country and as, a, a, you know, an interested party in reform, um, I very much hope that uh, whatever political um, disagreements um, um, are emerging uh, will again be sorted out in some spirit of consensus uh, with the wider interests of the nation uh, as top of the mind and that um, there shouldn't be any significant or material delay in the rolling out of the GST. Dr. Rajiv Lal, I'm going to leave it at that. Many thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you.